many thanks for to USIP for um, working with us on the event and bringing their expertise on nonviolent uh, movements to the project and to this event. Uh, thank you too to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and to the Swiss Ministry, Swiss Foreign Ministry for supporting CR in this project in um, different ways, including financially. Um, we'll be hearing later from Kate Buchanan. Kate was the specialist editor for this publication. And so big thanks to Kate. It's been great working with her on it. She is a mediation and process design specialist working in the, for the UN Special Envoys Office, Yemen, as a senior advisor, and for the Myanmar Livelihoods and Food Security Fund as a conflict advisor. Um, she's got a very long and distinguished CV, Kate, which I, I think everyone got, got the CV's um, bio sent to them. So I won't read the, read the whole thing out now in the interests of brevity, because it, it's, it's long and distinguished, but it, uh, big thanks to Kate and um, look forward to her involvement a bit later on. So I'm very, very quickly just going to brief uh, introduce the publication and then give you some housekeeping and then um, we'll get started. Um, so the publication is looking at the early phases of peace processes. Formative efforts to establish dialogue during ongoing violent, um, formative, excuse me, efforts to establish dialogue during ongoing conflict are largely informal, opaque and secret. The reality of peace processes is messy and phase, phases crisscross one another. Armed actors talk and fight at the same time, negotiations stop, start and mutate over many years. Early peacemaking is invariably too late as violence and repression are embedded in societies and political systems. Perhaps one of the sort of persistent challenges for peace processes is um, linking efforts to end the violent conflict and then build a sustainable and inclusive peace. And there are tensions, I think, between those two ambitions. And that's a long-standing challenge for peace processes, but I, want, I think one that remains one of the sort of big challenges for us as peace builders. Um, and how peace processes start is really important in that. Um, how they start is very influential on how they, how they go on. Engaging the people who are responsible for violence in early conversations is obviously essential to stopping the violence. But what does that mean then for the process as it goes forward? It tends to be that armed actors dominate the process and it's very hard to shift later on. So peace process models where um, more inclusive ways of working are injected as, as the, later on in the process as it progresses have struggled to really deliver inclusive results. So that's why we were quite interested in this early phase and we felt too it was under under research, not least because it's it's quite murky and often very secretive, so it's hard to get people to talk about it or write down write it down or analyze it. So we were really interested in this project. Um, I'm really thrilled to have such a stellar stellar lineup of contributors with us tonight as well. One of the privileges of working on Accord is the range of expertise that you get to work with regularly, and it's it's a big thrill on these kinds of occasions where um, we actually put a, a a face to a name often and, and get them um, people to, to join us in these kinds of um, these kinds of conversation. Um, so to kick us off, Tabitha Thompson, the acting director of the program on nonviolent action at USIP, will quickly touch on USIP's focus on nonviolent action and their peace process support work. Um, and after that, we'll move on to um, a range of uh, different speakers. Um, we won't provide lengthy introductions to the speakers because uh, we've got lots of things to get through tonight and um, the time is tight. And I, I think um, Felix Colchester sent you people's bios, but I will introduce people briefly when we start. Just a, a little piece of housekeeping before I hand over to Tabitha. Please note that the event will be recorded for upload to Conciliation Resources YouTube channel and website. Uh, in order to see our speakers clearly, can I ask you to switch your cameras off with the exception of our speakers? Um, in, but please ensure that your Zoom profiles display your full name and ensure that you remain muted unless you're trying to ask a question or make a point. 
Um, we would encourage you to write comments and reflections in the chat bar as the event progresses. Um, you're always also welcome to put questions in the chat bar that we'll do our best to pick up and address in the Q&A sessions. There'll be one halfway through and then a longer one at the end. Um, if possible, please try to direct your question to a particular speaker. Um, if you want to ask your question in person, and we'd really like you to do that, please put question in the chat bar and we'll get to you um, when we can. And finally, if you have technical difficulties, um, please contact Felix, Felix Colchester by email or sending him a direct, rather sending him a direct message in the Zoom chat function rather than send him an email. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, we've got a lot to get through. I'm gonna hand over to Tabitha now. Tabitha is Senior Program Officer and Acting Director of the Program on Nonviolent Action at USIP. Um, so over to you, Tabitha, thanks. Thanks very much, Sand, and thank you to everyone for taking the time to be here tonight and for Conciliation Resources for uh, letting us co-sponsor this event. Uh, just a quick note about the program on nonviolent action at USIP. We support applied research and capacity building to better understand nonviolent movements around the world as they seek to advance human rights, justice, and sustainable peace through what we call people power or collective action that builds power from the bottom up. And we're excited to co-sponsor this event with Conciliation Resources as we explore how to elevate and support inclusion from the start of the peace process, as well as how to engage and support non-traditional actors like nonviolent movements. We know that broad-based inclusion can bring greater legitimacy and public support to peace processes and lead to more durable peace agreements. And we also know that nonviolent movements by their very nature are powerfully inclusive. They attract large diverse swaths of society in their work. They're rooted in communities and they rely on the collective action of ordinary people. And nonviolent movements are often led by individuals and direct, that are directly affected by violence and injustice, including women and youth. From the front lines of the farmers' protests in India, the social media tactics used in the NSARS campaign in Nigeria, and to the transnational solidarity symbolism that we see across Southeast Asia, we don't have to look far to see the power of their leadership. But how can movement power and collective demands be translated to sustainable policy outcomes at the negotiating table? We see a shift occurring in the mediation and nonviolent movement communities. Researchers and practitioners from both fields have been coming together to better understand the ways in which nonviolent movements can contribute to more sustainable peace and why they should be engaged as conflict actors in their own right. But more needs to be done to explore how external actors, including external mediators, can support their inclusion and engagement from the start in the face of significant but not unsurmountable challenges. And that's why this discussion today that we're having is so practical and timely. In addition to laying out the problem and why addressing it is important, the report in this discussion is also bringing together leading thinkers in the field to discuss the how, which for me as a practitioner who supports frontline activists, I'm very grateful for. So thank you to all of the speakers for taking the time to be here today to share more about your work and research. And I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thanks so much, Tabitha, that's really great. Um, so. We're going to kick straight off then, um, starting with uh, Sophie Hesperslag, who's going to be talking about conflict parties building political will for dialogue. Uh, so um, Sophie is a scholar practitioner who investigates conflict resolution and the transition of armed actors away from violence. She teaches at American University in Cairo and is a program associate at Conciliation Resources. Sophie. Thank you very much, Sand. So with the time I have, um, I'm going to just focus on, on a number of key aspects. I'm afraid I'm going to focus on some of the challenges of the early phases of peace process. But uh, do not worry. I will um, share some examples of how, how some of these challenges have been overcome. And for that, um, I'll particularly turn to the case of the negotiations in Colombia with the FARC, uh, which led to the peace agreements that we, a lot of you um, from USIP to the people on the call know about, which was signed in 2016. But I'll focus specifically on the very early phases of that process uh, from like 2010 to 2012. So um, I'll also uh, highlight uh, the particular challenges of early phases of peace processes when it comes to um, dialogue with groups that have been listed as terrorist actors. 
Um, and I'll explain why just in a second. Um, as Zand and Tabitha highlighted, um, a, a key contribution of this publication is that it highlighted the importance of um, supporting diverse pathways for dialogue, right? Include like increasing the early inclusion of a whole range of actors from uh, the mobilization of nonviolent actors to insider mediators and others who can play a key role in these very early phases of peace process. Now, a big problem with the terrorist framing is that it really often makes it impossible for those actors to play their roles because they're criminalized, the political space is reduced, especially in cases where some of those actors, even though they're nonviolent, might have links to actors that are potentially listed. So this has also a direct repercussion um, on the extent to which the conflict parties themselves can be prepared for dialogue. Um, so the terrorist framing really um, increases the isolation, let's say, of the labeled group because their interaction uh, with the rest of the country, both um, say in the case of Colombia, Colombians, but also foreigners, um, was fundamentally reduced um, and what happened really was that the only context they did have was with uh, like-minded individuals or groups that really sort of shared their world vision and didn't really challenge that um, and didn't really push them to see a transition or a political exit. Now, there's a very interesting initiative that took place in Colombia, I think that we could learn lessons from um, in our discussion today. Um, it's the um, letter exchange that was set up by a group of civil society activists and uh, intellectuals called Colombianas and Colombianas por la Paz. Uh, they did a three year long letter exchange with the FARC. It's what's called an epistolary exchange. So these are public letters. Um, 45 letters were exchanged over quite a long period of time. And through this letter exchange, this group of civil society activists and intellectual um, engaged with the FARC politically and convinced them to release not only 40 hostages, but also to put an end to hostage taking as a practice in the warfare. So this was a really key signal when it came to both showing their willingness and commitment to the government, but also a, a change um, to the Colombian public at large. And so this is one of the lessons that we can draw of how can policymakers um, encourage this type um, of behavior and en engagement instead of, of criminalizing it. Now, another key development, and that's one of the key things I focus on, at least in my research, is how um, the shift in discourse in rhetoric happened in this very early phase of the peace process. Um, I describe this as a, as a linguistic ceasefire, but basically what happened in Colombia was that um, the presidency of Juan Manuel Santos, even before negotiations were was even being discussed in Colombia, started shifting during the whole early phase of the negotiation, the way that the FARC were being labeled and understood. Um, so I pick up on three particular points. The first one is that um, the, the armed conflict is recognized and the armed group is recontextualized in this armed conflict. The second point is that the terrorist label is actually dropped and you don't see it anymore linked to, as a descriptive of the armed group. But also there's an uncoupling happening between the actual act of violence, whether that's terrorism or other, and the actor. Um, making the possibility for change possible. And so this is something I've traced in my own research. So I can go into it in discussions, uh, but over a period of, of 20 years and how um, the, it's linked to the typical um, pattern of uh, devilification that has to happen in the lead up to peace negotiations. But in this very early phases of dialogue with the terrorist branding and listing, um, it becomes a kind of an extra hurdle. So while this managed to sort of shift the situation enough um, to create kind of the political space for, for uh, uh, early talks to take place um, and uh, um, amongst the, uh, let's say the elites and the belligerent actors, the conflict parties themselves, um, it still kind of failed to uh, convince the broader Colombian public. And, um, and the challenges of the transition of the FARC, as we even see nowadays, into a polit 
political party are still very much ongoing. Um, and the most tra tragic and, and um, worrying end of that is obviously, as you know, um, many FARC leaders are still being targeted and assassinated and a lot of people associate that to the continuing labeling um, and framing and polarization of these group as terrorist actors. Um, so just to conclude, um, I think uh, one of the things that I, I, I hadn't mentioned yet was that the interna internal cohesion of actors, of the belligerent actors, is essential in these early phases of peace process. And that's one of the reasons that in the case of Colombia, when a President Manuel Santos shifted his discourse vis-a-vis -vis the FARC, he actually allowed the military and the Ministry of Defense to continue um, using uh, this kind of polarizing and um, vilifying language uh, as a way of bringing the military with him and ensuring actually um, that they continued to fight the FARC even in the early phase of, of the peace process. Um, because um, how would they have motivated the military otherwise? And so um, this kind of tension between the need for, for cohesion of the group, but also uh, this shift of discourse and the, the, the kind of the signaling uh, that's important in terms of um, uh, overcoming uh, the deep polarization to bring along uh, the broader citizenship and consistency constituency um, has been a huge um, challenge and continues to be um, uh, something that um, uh, we see uh, happening in Colombia today. So um, I'll stop now and, and I'm very happy to go into more uh, details in the discussion. Thanks so much, Sophie. That's full marks on content and on timing as well. You know, fascinating and ended within your time slot. So well done for that. Yeah, really interesting. and. Perhaps um, we'll see what happens in the Q&A, but um, with the sort of linguistic ceasefire, that um, it's not just one direction of travel, I suppose, is one of the challenges, you know, things can move back in the other direction, as we've seen in Colombia with the change of the change of government and a big Definitely. change of rhetoric and change of behaviour. So that would be something that would we, we, be fascinating to talk about later on. Um, so thanks for that again. We're going to have... Um, uh, Jonathan Pinckney now is going to be talking about nonviolent movements, setting the stage for peace processes. Um, Jonathan is program officer and research lead for the program on nonviolent a action at USIP and author of From Dissent to Democracy, The Promise and Peril of Civil Resistance Transitions. Jonathan. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sand. Uh, it's a pleasure to get to share a little bit with all of you on how nonviolent action can set the stage for peace processes uh, as I wrote about in the Accord chapter, uh, as well as I'll talk about some of the additional research uh, that uh, our team at USIP has been doing uh, on this crucial question. Uh, first, I want to briefly define what I mean by nonviolent action, since this is a term that can be unclear and has many misconceptions. Nonviolent action is a way that unarmed civilians shift power in a conflict that goes outside of existing political institutions but does not use physical violence. It typically uses tactics that you're all familiar with, like protests, strikes, and boycotts, but isn't identical to any one of these. Nonviolent action movements are groups of people or organizations that are sometimes diffuse, sometimes highly organized, that use nonviolent action to bring about a political change. Nonviolent action movements have played numerous roles in situations of armed conflict, uh, and can shape the ground for peace processes in several different ways, three of which are particularly common and influential uh, and that I'll, I'll focus on in the remainder of my time. So first, uh, nonviolent action movements often focus on reducing violence during times of conflict itself. This can help protect local social infrastructures and put communities in a better position to recover after the conflict ends. Uh, this kind of action doesn't typically look like big protests in the streets or, you know, photo like uh, international media friendly public events, uh, but instead more typically takes the form of quieter organizing dialogue and refusal to cooperate with armed actors uh, that we see in places uh, like the peace communities of the Colombian Civil War that uh, Sophie was speaking about before. Second. Uh, nonviolent movements can provide a source of third party pressure on warring parties to come to the negotiating table. Uh, as in the famous example of uh, Nova Laureate Lema Bawi and her Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace movement, 
uh, in which women protesters successfully pushed both sides of the Liberian civil war to reach a peace agreement, uh, including through protests and sit-ins at the site of the negotiation itself. So first setting the ground by pushing people to come to the negotiating table uh, and then pushing them at the negotiation table to come to a conclusion. Uh, and recent research uh, supported by USIP uh, shows that this effect uh, is consistent across a wide range of civil wars uh, in places where movements protested against conflict and also engaged politically with the conflict actors, negotiations were much more likely to be initiated and more sort of direct forceful tactics uh, like the sit-ins that the Liberian women held during, these, uh, during the peace negotiations made it more likely that those negotiations would end in an agreement. So that's our, our second role in sort of putting third party pressure. Uh, third, some nonviolent movements uh, may not neutrally push both sides to come to a peace agreement, but may instead seek to transform violent conflict through using nonviolent action in coordination with an armed actor. So for instance, in Nepal, an alliance of mainstream political parties negotiated an agreement uh, with that country's uh, Maoist rebels to join in nonviolent action to oust the Nepali king in the 2006 Second People's Movement. This cooperation crucially gave the Maoist rebels a avenue out of violent conflict and back into normal political contention and paved the way for the comprehensive peace accord that ended Nepal's civil war later that year. So when it comes to setting the stage for dialogue and peace agreements, nonviolent movements play several key roles. International peace builders can better help foster peace by understanding and engaging with these movements, not just as you know, third parties or avenues to accessing public opinion, but as actors who shape the conflict space in their own right, uh, as Tabitha mentioned at the beginning. Understanding their position in society, mapping their relationships with violent conflict actors, and building relationships with and the capacity of activists and movement leaders can be crucial for setting the stage for peace. Uh, with that, I'll uh, wrap up. Thank you again for the invitation and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thanks, Jonathan. That was um, really fascinating, yeah. And um, a big issue, the whole thing of nonviolent movements, I think. And uh, if we get time, perhaps we could discuss a bit later on whether um, nonviolent movements have a more direct role in peace negotiations and peace processes and whether mediators have an obligation to make space for nonviolent movements to have a more sort of formal role. Um, thanks ever so much. So um, moving on to our um, third and final speaker in this, this first part of the, the evening. Um, Ali al Hassem is going to be talking about Syria and local peacemaking in the midst of conflicts, the case of Manbij. Ali, please. Hey, thank, thank you, uh, Alexander and um, USIP uh, and uh, Constellation. Um, uh, actually, the, the case is uh, indeed um, uh, a practical one. I'm not going to get into uh, theories and, and uh, uh, concepts, uh, just like outlining uh, the case uh, that um, we have worked on uh, which is Minbij. Uh, so Minbij is a small city uh, in the north of Syria. Uh, the city has gained uh, a significant attention uh, in two key events uh, after the first wave of protest in 2011. And actually it's a coincidence that today marks uh, the 10th anniversary uh, together with uh, the 15th of, of uh, March. Uh, of the uprising. Uh, so the first event was um, when it when the city fell to the hands of, of ISIS, uh, the Islamic State in 2014, and its uh, liberation uh, by the Global Coalition Against uh, Daesh or ISIS uh, ally, uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, uh, known as uh, SDF in 2016. So this uh, partnership empowered uh, the Kurdish majority uh, military body to expand and increase its territory and influence outside of uh, Kurdish uh, majority areas. And the second uh, event uh, was at the end of uh, 2018, uh, when Turkey threatened to move forces uh, to seize the city, uh, the thing that drew the attention of uh, other actors like the Syrian regime, which also deployed forces uh, to head first. 
Uh, however, civilians fell uh, prey for those uh, rivals, which made the elderly and elites come to the conclusion uh, of keeping the status quo for the following considerations. Uh, first, uh, the city has become a safe haven for IDPs from other areas uh, and cities which were, which fell under the control of the uh, Assad regime uh, at that time. Second, the local populations were promised to be in power and take key governing positions. Third, the available alternative options um, were no better than uh, the SDF, bearing in mind the deteriorating security and economic uh, situation uh, in the areas. And the fourth and last consideration is the presence of the US forces on the ground, uh, which has given the population uh, an assurance that uh, stability would be a priority for the US uh, government in SDF controlled areas. So my focus actually is on the uh, second uh, con consideration, uh, which is uh, namely the empowerment of local populations to govern their city. Uh, here I am quoting one of, of our uh, respondents. <coughs> Quote, uh, one of, uh, sorry. Uh, so here's, here's the quote, uh, raising glamorous slogans local and international forums can only bear fruit if coupled with practical application on the ground. So uh, just to give a background of, of the city, uh, Menbij is uh, a majority Arab city. There are, there were, there are more than 80% who are Arabs. The rest are uh, different other ethnicities, uh, Circassian and Kurds, uh, Turkmen's. Uh, so uh, when the SDF took control of the city, they promised that uh, you know, a quota will be uh, applied. The city will be governed by its people, uh, but the, 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 it, it was uh, very um, contentious actually to apply to apply this. So the proportion of uh, representation was not fully applied uh, in Minbij, while the military council was uh, headed by two Arabs and two Kurds, uh, all men, with uh, additional two female. Kurdish fighters known as Kadros, uh, who are descending from the Kandil uh, mountains. Uh, thus, working against the quota postulated in the organization charter. Moreover, quote, leadership positions are re reserved for Kurds while administrative ones are for the Arabs. Uh, on the other hand, the traditional way of life in the city has made it challenging for women to participate and occupy usually for men roles. Uh, many locals perceive the administration's governing uh, style and plans as non-applicable to, to Menbij context. And in some instances, instances are perceived as no different uh, of that of the Ba'ath uh, ideology, uh, the, uh, uh, the, political, uh, the ruling political party in Syria in adoring the leader and the uh, party teachings. Uh, it's noteworthy that women have perceived the women's initiatives and their institutionalization as a positive sign in acting laws that regulate their freedoms. Uh, and here, some final remarks uh, fr from, the, uh, from the paper, from the research. Women's inclusion in early phases of local uh, institution building and policy implementation demonstrated a level of acceptance in some quarters. However, inconsistency in the realization of the autonomous administration and the ideology that underpin it have also caused friction. Most importantly, the rhetoric of inclusion has not materialized equitably for all communities and identities. Practitioners and policy makers can facilitate inclusive peace, not only in Northern Syria, but also in other geographies of the country without exacerbating power inequalities. The obvious disparities in distribution of power sharing of power exist and international alignments contribute to this. Finally, 
the contribution of outside powers and actors' policies to creating uneven distributions of power and to increasing local tensions along ethnic and religious lines must be considered. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ali. That was um, really fascinating. And just to remind people, these are all um, articles that are in the Accord publication, which is on Conciliation Resources website free. So do go and visit them. They're all, they're all excellent. Um, we've got about um, just over 10 minutes now for um, some questions, uh, comments. So um, I'm not sure if there's any been sent in yet. Um, please do put question into the chat box if you have something to ask. Um, I've got loads of questions if, if, if nobody else has. So um, please try and get in there before me. Otherwise, you'll just have to listen to me having a conversation with, with the others. So I, I'll give people a, a few moments to put something in there. Um, but actually, if you're, while you're thinking, um, Sophie, the, the thing I mentioned at the end of your, um, your presentation, um, that things can go in, in different directions, you know, and is there, um, and, and you were talking about how the language changes, and I guess it was quite deliberate on some sides to change the language, to move it in certain directions, but um, it's going in quite a negative direction now. Is I mean, anything that you see that could be done about what's happening in terms of the language now or, or just your observations on how things have sort of uh, fluctuated over time in Colombia particularly? Um, maybe just briefly, um, I think you're, you're very right uh, talking about fluctuation but also the strategic element and I guess uh, what I've seen is that the um, the, the, the changes um, generally at that level have to come from the top, right? Uh, it's, it's similar to the discussions we have about, for instance, what we saw in the vilification level, you know, in the US with Trump and the, and the shift towards the Biden administration. Um, in, in the case of Colombia, um, until 9-11, um, the FARC had always been vilified as a non-state armed actor, a violent insurgent, you know, you name it. Labels are a usual, um, you know, tool in any armed conflict on both sides, right? And on the side of the armed group towards the government. But what shifted fundamentally post 9-11 is with the terrorist framing, um, is that it heightened that vilification and kind of blocked it in an area of sort of non-negotiability. And so I guess what I saw is that there was enough of a strategic shift in the language to happen to sort of bring it down a notch or a peg uh, to actually start formal negotiations with the group. But there wasn't enough of a fundamental shift. Of, uh, so it was only in 2015 that Santos actually told the generals, the Minister of Defense, etc., to stop to toning down the discourse or to the media, you know, um, that really strong messages were sent about de-escalating the language. Um, so that was very late, 2015. And then the, the agreement was signed in 2016. And, and you know, uh, people said no to the, the peace referendum. So it's really clear that when you unleash that kind of discourse, um, I think it was in one of our early meetings of this issue when somebody said, um, you know, listing and, and the terrorist framing is a bit like uranium, you know, once it, it, it kind of comes out, it goes everywhere and it's very hard to bring back. And so you can see it bring back from the brink with very strategic and top level kind of decision that, um, you know, messaging at all levels um, uh, to shift it, but then it can, as you're saying, very easily, um, you know, uh, gain ground again. And that's the issue, right? Is that you lose control of it uh, once you start using it, right? And so um, it, it, becomes, it becomes really challenging and deeply polarizing. But not only that, it's not just language we're talking about, we're to also talking about what it means in practice, the, the very concrete implication it means about about FARC leaders being killed, about uh, community leaders, you know, more than 700 community leaders have been killed since the signature of the agreement. These are not violent actors, you know, mentioned by Tabitha or Jonathan. Uh, these are people who are, you know, working at uh, the grassroots level and it's just creating this climate uh, where, you know, it's seen as kind of acceptable. Thanks so much, um, Sophie. And uh, we had a brilliant presentation at CR once from, 
um, some people in the Colombian military who were talking about mm -hmm. them having to re understand their understand. what they what they thought victory was you know and it mm -hmm. wasn't defeat of the enemy which they'd been trying to do for a long time it was mm -hmm. bringing the enemy enemy rethinking who the enemy were into a into a negotiation process um we've got two or three minutes left there's a couple of questions in here um so there's one which i'm going to direct to um to ali and to jonathan which is uh what role do you see technology playing in the early parts of these processes um both currently in the future, if you have any reflections on those. Um, and there's one more question, which is um, directed from Christian. This one, that last one was from uh, Ali. This is from Christian, um, directed particularly to Sophie, but I think open to the other two. Um, how to argue the case for delisting um, uh, uh, non-state actors labeled as terrorists with governments that have defined them as such? Any recommendations for third parties? So. Um, Maybe if we go in reverse order and everyone has like a minute and a half to to pick up on either of those two, whichever either of those two you feel um, you want to. So um, starting uh, starting with you, please, Ali. Sorry, Alex, can you say it again? Because there was an interruption, actually. Oh, excuse me. There's two questions. Yeah. If okay. you feel like you've got something to say to either of them, and if you don't, that's fine. One of them is... Um, uh, we were just talking about listing of terrorist listing of non-state armed actors. Um, how to argue against of, of, for um, delisting non-state armed actors? How can you argue argue with governments? What are the cases you can make with governments to delist them, especially for third-party actors? Or the role of technology um, in supporting early peacemaking? Those are the two questions. We, you only have about a minute and a half, I'm afraid, to. to okay. okay. And there will be more opportunity to talk later. Uh, okay, yeah, we, I will reply briefly, actually, and uh, especially at, at times of, of, of wars or civil wars, it is very difficult in, indeed, because uh, demonizing uh, it is, it is also a, a battle of linguistics, uh, as um, Sophie put it uh, earlier. Um, it is the realization actually of all parties to the conflict that we need to sit down and, and, and talk. Uh, as long as there is, um, you know, the big actor is um, gaining uh, territory, it, it is very difficult. And, and now we see it in the in the in the Syrian context, because the government has never seen any uh, rivals as uh, um, uh, competing. Rather, they are terrorist groups uh, or those who have uh, to be under the umbrella of the government. So if there is no real uh, peace process, an inclusive one, uh, it is very difficult to, uh, to draw lines between uh, terrorist groups and uh, illegitimate uh, uh, government. And in the case, this is uh, the case of, of, of Syria. Uh, now with the technology, the technology has played really uh, a positive uh, uh, and also a negative role uh, because it has the the battle has moved from the uh, from the elite level and and those uh, officials in positions and and also on the other other side to the uh, local and and very uh, societal level and that that is that is actually the the two edged sword uh, that is very difficult uh, to to I mean, to maneuver uh, at, at times of, of, uh, of conflict. Uh, so capitalizing on the uh, uh, local uh, and, and uh, low micro level uh, initiatives can really uh, change or be in the, in, in, uh, yeah, on the side of, of uh, peace initiatives. Excellent, thanks very much. Um... Ali, and then to you, Jonathan, briefly, maybe you want to have a go at the one about um, technology. Yeah, I also offer a couple of thoughts there. So I think the, the impact of technology and in particular sort of information communications technology and social media on nonviolent movements is something that a lot of people have written about. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of speculation on. And I think one of the most important effects here is that this kind of technology makes mobilization easier but makes sustaining mobilization harder uh, in many ways. 
Um, and so what we have seen as kind of social media as a mobilizing tool has become more and more common is that large protest movements are becoming more frequent, but they are succeeding less often. And so I think in sort of what I was talking about before about the, the potential for nonviolent movements to put pressure on armed actors through public tactics like protests, strikes, et cetera. Um, again, it's easier to sort of get a large number of people on the streets to protest for peace, uh, say, uh, but because you don't have to build the same sorts of organizational infrastructures in order to sustain that over time that movements had in the past, uh, the, the power of that signal uh, may be attenuated somewhat uh, and makes it more difficult for them to actually sort of effectively wield that power. Thanks so much, Jonathan. That's, yeah, we've got, um, it's really fascinating. We've got lots of stuff on technology in the publication, actually. And one of the things that comes out is technology is really useful, but it's not a replacement for human beings. It's the two working together that is, is a sort of powerful way forward. Sophie, if I can ask you just to be a minute on the um, NSA question and what can yes. we do? What can third <laughs> do? My favorite on topic. Uh, anyway, yeah. thanks for the question. <laughs> thanks for the question. Um, basically, what happens with, with listing armed groups as terrorists is that it raises the entry cost of dialogue, right? Any type of dialogue. And so that's kind of what policymakers need to understand. If you didn't have that, the entry cost wouldn't be quite so high. And you do have governments who chosen to distance themselves from this approach, like Norway that in 2006 moved away uh, from aligning itself with the EU um, terrorist um, regimes. Um, now I've mentioned how it isolates uh, the armed group, but what I hadn't mentioned in my talk is the impact it has on the government. And I think that's a key thing to think of from the policymakers perspective is that by, by listing the armed group, what you're doing is you're bolstering the government to such a degree that it's working against the kind of the basic mechanisms of, you know, the notions of ripeness and the mutually hurting stalemate and the way out. It kind of clouds their perception. They really don't feel the pain of the confrontation, basically. They think they're going to win and there's no reason they're not going to win because they're getting uh, both the legitimacy uh, and symbolic support, but also the material support that often comes in hand in hand with military equipment, intelligence, etc. and etc. And so I guess what I would be arguing is that um, instead of having one side of the violence considered as terrorist and the other side of the violence considered as legitimate, if you're actually labeling the actions, whether they're terrorist or other things, and not the actors, then you're making it much more possible to focus on the violence and not necessarily blocking the situation. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Sophie, and thanks very much to our panelists. Um, we're going to move into the next phase now. I'm going to hand over to Kate uh, Buchanan, who's going to um, moderate this next part of it. Apologies to um, there's a, there's a question in there from, and apologies to my pronunciation, Dauda as well, um, that we haven't had time for your question. There will be time for more Q&A in the next session. Um, also, just to encourage people to put questions in, but also we'd like to hear from you in, in person as well. So do put question and, and if you'd feel comfortable to, to say your question rather than just write it, it'd be great to see you. Um, anyway, thanks ever so much. Kate, I've nicked about five or six minutes of your time. I'm sorry for that, um, but handing over to you now. Thanks, and. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, I had the pleasure of being the specialist editor of this accord, and it was just fantastic to work with all these different people that we have on the panel today, and a whole lot more that unfortunately, for time reasons, we were not able to include. So um, our second half of, of the panel is um, we have four uh, of our authors, and I'm going to ask Erin uh, Grizzley and uh, Ayak Chol to kick us off on youth. We'll also touch on self-determination, which of course underpins so many violent conflicts, and then look at a, a fairly overlooked but quite practical uh, peace support mechanism with peace secretariats. So over to Irena and Ayak. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kate. So Ayak and I will speak to the role and mobilization of young people in early peacemaking and the harnessing of digital technologies. And there's many points already been raised by some of the other panelists that are pertinent to this discussion. So young people often constitute the majority demographic in countries with ongoing peace processes, uh, be it 70% of the population in Afghanistan or 73% in South Sudan. 
yet they're often, as we know, marginalized. And there has been considerably little research and understanding on where and how young people engage in and shape peace negotiations. The first global policy paper on youth participation in peace processes titled We Are Here, of which I'm a privileged to be a co-author, sought to address this. And it consolidates country-specific examples and presents a framework for understanding youth engagement in peace processes um, from the experiences and, and perspectives of young people themselves. And this is a nascent field that seeks to dispel harmful stereotypes and narratives of young people, and it's complementary to the broader inclusion agenda. Uh, where much more uh, investment, uh, research, and understanding is, of course, needed. So a few points I'd like to make. The first is, uh, what is clear is that if we apply traditional track models to how young people mobilize and engage in early peacemaking uh, and during peace negotiations, we miss the important uh, informal and interconnected ways that young women and men shape these uh, processes. Young people often use creative, alternative, informal, and innovative approaches to influence formal talks from the outside. Uh, for example, by creating bridges that connect negotiators in the room to communities affected by violence, consolidating substantive inputs from youth and women representatives, and building public accountability and demand for peace before and during formal talks through social media. In particular, experiences of young people in early peace talks underscores the significance of technology to open pathways to peace. And as been mentioned by uh, some others on, on this panel already, it's an understatement that technology will continue to redefine our society, including future conflict dynamics. And today's generation, of course, is born into everyday use of technology. Um, and young people have harnessed digital tools and platforms to bring inclusivity and diversity into peace processes that was previously not possible. For example, in the Nakuru County peace process in Kenya in 2010, uh, young people um, took it to themselves that they no longer wanted to fall into a trap of incitement to violence by political elites. So they mobilized to form the Naraku Nakuru County Youth Bunge, and Bunge being the Swahili term for parliament. Uh, and this association represented over 350 young people and they were signatories to the peace agreement. And through using peer-to-peer -peer mobile phone networks, there were extremely coordinated and rapid misinformation management that um, mitigated a lot of violent uh, spikes and they uh, promoted peace campaigns through these networks also. In Myanmar presently, as we've seen the news, young people are mediating and paving their own pathway for peace and democracy through the use of digital platforms, which are at risk and at threat. Um, and using tools to coordinate messages of solidarity and, and long-term strategies. So these examples highlight, and I'll hand to Ayak in just a moment, that we need to increase the understanding, uh, the recognition, legitimacy, and leverage of youth voices, particularly those outside of the room, and the power and potential of digital technology to open multi-spatial channels for engagement. Of course, mindful to not exacerbate inequalities, and careful to not let these technologies be a substitute for meaningful and sustained participation, as has been mentioned by Jonathan. I'm very pleased now to hand over to Ayak Chol, who will discuss how young women and men mobilized peace efforts in the early stages of South Sudan's high level revitalization forum and the role of mobile technology in these efforts. Ayak, over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Um... Yeah, so the South Sudan example, in 2017, we had as a country to go through a vitalization process uh, of, of, the, um, of the dying peace <laughs> that had been signed earlier. Um, and how youth prepared for that. In the previous round of talks, there were very few uh, youth represented and most were in the political parties. How we youth in the civil society spaces then uh, organized was to form a strategy group online, uh, appoint several members of us uh, to actually follow with the mediation team and ensure that we had young people accredited on the table as equals, as stakeholders, not as uh, observers, but as equal stakeholders on the table to negotiate on behalf of the young people. 
The second step was then to pressure political parties and the warring parties to also ensure that young people were representatives were represented in their ranks. Uh, we made it a very clear point to name and shame political parties that did not do that. That was all courtesy of the strategy group that had us linking between the peace talks in Addis and different uh, what we called kitchens, uh, where different um, uh, groups of civil society youth. Uh, were camping out um, in Kampala, in Juba, in uh, Nairobi, and in Addis as well. Um, we also used uh, social media in other me other ways. We used um, this platform that we call the E-Delegates Forum, uh, which was uh, linked which was a youth in the room. The technical support team was around the youth, but we did not necessarily have access to the room where the talks were held and grassroots. And the function of this uh, e-delegates forum was to, to, um, to curb misinformation and to alleviate the panic that was already building uh, just by the mere fact that the peace was about to fail and it was being revitalized once again. Um, uh, and the, the function of these technical, of these, um, um, e delegates was were the e delegates were linked to also uh, members of civil society in the internally displaced people camps where people are, are camped and you know on on ethnic affiliations um, and uh, the uh, refugee camps as well where there was a lot of tension rising uh, during that time civil society particularly the youth because civil society is predominantly youth. Um, you know, did a lot to curb the tensions, to to just um, stop a possible flare of violence uh, that you know that was brewing. You know, uh, as the peace was progressing, um, we also used um, art and social media. Uh, we had a campaign that we called South Sudan is Watching, and it had um, eyeglasses with a map of South Sudan on it. Um, and it at the back, um, and it and we also printed the same photos on T-shirts um, that said, uh, you know, your time is up. You know, peace must hold. Um, and this uh, glasses were used as frames on Facebook. They were used as uh, frames on uh, WhatsApp. And I think. In less than a week, most of the people uh, that I knew on on my face on my wall, that's over five thousand people on Facebook. You know, most of those people, most of them already had, uh, you know, those frames as as their as their uh, as their profile pictures. Um, and then we also held concerts, awareness concerts between the the between the sessions between the 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 talks. Um, and those were artistic. There were there was a lot of art. There was a lot of drama. The spoken word poetry, murals on the wall, and those events were also uh, streamed live on Facebook. Uh, and the key message was, you know, uh, this is it's not an ethnic issue. It is a political issue, and we have to hold our leadership accountable. Um, so that also was trying to create. Uh, we were trying to create a peaceful, uh, an environment of co, an environment, co an, an environment of coexistence in the face of, um, in the face of talks that were, um, that were painted as ethnic, uh, as a, as, as an ethnic war instead of a political war. Uh, so that was it was also very very instrumental. Um, yeah, so we 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 also had concerts. There were online talk shows, uh, and so on. I think for us, like the most important things that we uh, that that was the result of that peace talks was we realized that um, if some things had been done, the position of youth would have been better, uh, and that is um, not just the accreditation of a youth uh, representative on the table. Uh, but right from the beginning, having having it mandated the same way it is known as a blueprint that political parties, warring factions have to bring in women on board as a blueprint for inclusion, that also has to apply for youth. It cannot become an afterthought. It has not, it is not 
civil society's job to lobby for that. It should be in the blueprint of all mediated peace talks. Um, accreditation of young mediators. There's so many young mediators out there. There was the effect of having a female mediator among the mediation team, and that allowed for a 35% affirmative action that was echoed across the seven chapters of the peace docket. And I, I'm, I can just imagine what it would have been like to have an ally on the mediation team, a youth face that could identify with the majority of South Sudanese and ensure the same sentiments were echoed across the seven chapters, youth, 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 and youth interests. Um, another issue is the issue of um, post talks burnt. It's not so sexy. people don't want to talk about it, but it's the ability of young people, the people that are working on minimum wage, volunteering. Um, the, the fast pace of the peace talks is very, very draining. And as the peace talks is consumed with the big guns, you know, the people that have killed or, you know, have some sort of power um, uh, in that sense, you have the majority of the young people that have worked through this peace process burn out. And so follow up, um, there is also the issue of intimidation of young people in these spaces. Um, there is the issue of funding. Sometimes it's very difficult to find um, funding because there, you know, peace talks has, is an, especially if it's a type of peace talks like the South Sudan peace talks, the, the dynamics is it's ever evolving. Locations are changing. Uh, you know, this person comes in, there's a new faction, there's new allegiances being formed on the sidelines. And as civil society, as youth, people need to act to ensure that youth interests are reflected irrespective of, you know, who who comes in or who, or who isn't. Um, and so flexibility of funding allows, you know, for youth, for organizations, for loosely formed coalitions that are not your typical everyday set in stone type of uh, institutions that, you know, donor agencies are used uh, to. Uh, I think the other thing is that we just need to acknowledge that um, youth mobilization is not set in stone. It's ever evolving. This is a new, it's new era. Um, there are no boundaries anymore, maybe physical boundaries, but courtesy of social media, the outreach is, is, is great. And because of it, the type of support that is given to youth in these spaces also has to match the type of innovation, the type of creativity, the type of energy that youth bring. Um, to these type of, of setups. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't talked too much. <laughs> Not at all, Ayak. Thanks so much to you and Irina. Um, and I think a lot of questions are starting to pop into the chat um, and or comments. Um, the point that you make uh, the, about the glasses and the, and, the, and the lenses as part of the campaign, um, I think that that is pitch perfect, but also just really tallies with the point that's made across the accord about different filters and different lenses, youth lenses, gender lenses, understanding, seeing local mediators, insider mediators. So um, it's, it's a really perfect um, illustration. But what we'll do is pop to Ulrika and um, uh, who's focusing on peace secretariats, indeed is an expert on this, having um, completed a PhD on the topic. Thanks, Ulrika. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, essentially connecting back to Sophie's input in a, in a bit, I'm also going to speak about conflict parties, but from a different and seemingly technical institutional angle, if you will, um, since I'm going to speak about peace secretariats uh, and their role in preparing common ground for former talks. Um, since peace secretariats are often created in a rush when talks are about to start already, uh, the modalities of peace secretariats do not always receive enough attention. And it makes sense to consider establishing and supporting them early on already during pre-formal preparation stages or talks about talks and integrate them in a more comprehensive infrastructure for peace. Uh, that is the landscape of actors, networks and institutions that support the peace process. Um, I'll cover three points briefly. Uh, so what are peace secretariats really? 
how do they help with preparing the ground uh, for dialogue and what are challenges and leverage points for you. So peace secretariats are part of the backbone structure of the peace process that supports the negotiating parties really. They're established by and, and very closely affiliated with at least one of the conflict parties. Uh, sometimes they're created at a later stage or transformed into something that is uh, mutual conducive for all the parties when it comes to implementing uh, peace agreements, but in an initial stage, uh, they are usually just affiliated to one of them for obvious reasons. Um, conflict parties typically decide to establish secretariats when formal talks are underway or being prepared, um, but there are examples that uh, they have been established much earlier, and that seems to be something that, that could provide to be useful um, in facilitating early stages. Peace secretaries implement tasks assigned to them by the leaders of conflict parties or the negotiators usually. And these include, of course, secretarial duties, uh, such as note-taking, archiving, logistical support, which might appear rather trivial, but are in fact quite essential to the talks. Um, then they are often charged with uh, doing communications, outreach, and media relations, uh, disseminating the messaging uh, and the narrative that leaders have decided to use uh, with regards to the peace process. Uh, Sophie, again, was speaking about that and about the language that was chosen by leadership. And then a peace secretary usually is the, the conduit. Uh, and, and has a, some kind of press unit uh, that would disseminate messaging. Um, but you can, you can also tweak that a little bit by, by maybe setting up peace secretariats that, that bring in perspectives in terms of conflict transformation. Um, maybe they can inform uh, messaging to a certain extent, and that might be very useful uh, in terms of supporting a process and conflict transformation altogether. Then their role is uh, obviously in strengthening also skills, uh, facilitating access to external expertise. They're often tasked with uh, bringing in consultants or providing uh, background information and advice to the negotiating team. They are liaising with mediators and other third parties, with civil society, and also representatives of other conflict parties at times. Um, they are facilitating consensus building within the constituencies um, and sometimes they really help with relationship building between the parties and even conflict management uh, when they're part of setups that, uh, that negotiate um, dealing with tensions, for example. Um, and for non-state armed groups, I think that's really important also to notice, peace secretariats can provide an organizational structure and often they are basically the first ad official address uh, that, that a party would have um, and that helps them to engage in dialogue. I think of the Taliban's um, secretariat in Doha, for example, but there are many other uh, similar um, uh, uh, examples. Um, and this obviously helps uh, to build a foundation um, for not only contacting a party, but also to build a foundation of skills and expertise, as well as trusted contact points. Um, they also do help with overcoming travel restrictions and, and uh, restrictions in freedom of movement um, by organizing logistics and being the conduit that um, embassies, for example, work with. In some, uh, you could say that peace secretaries can contribute to preparing the ground for dialogue by, first of all, building confidence in the peace process. They display a certain resolve of the parties to peace negotiations. You are actually making an investment by setting up this dedicated structure. Um, they improve the preparedness of the leadership and the conflict party altogether for dialogue. They help establishing sound communication channels, organize outreach and create access points with proximity and access to uh, the conflict party leadership. Um, they strengthen pro-peace actors within the camps of the conflict parties when building skills and bringing capabilities uh, to the team. Uh, and they can help provide opportunities for inclusion uh, of wider constituencies and effective representation of their views in the peace process if they're set up in a way that they liaise uh, and connect uh, with other tracks. 
Um, but that's already part of the challenges. Um, if you look at Secretariat's role, they are often poorly documented uh, due to the confidentiality of ongoing peace talks. But this is what we know. Um, first of all, as part of the party's internal affairs, the staffing and the mandates of secretariats are often politicized and instrumentalized. They're part of the political economy of the peace process, if you will, because they bring in resources. They are often receiving funding uh, from external actors. They are providing resources to the negotiating teams when it comes to recruitment of the secretarial staff or the allocation of the office uh, and its resources within the ranks of a conflict party. There is, there is quite a bit of tension sometimes, um, and that, that might be challenging uh, when, when trying to work with them. Um, secondly, in most cases, peace secretaries are set up as a temporary support structure that will expire once peace talks are finished. And that, that could be an issue and a problem. And it's actually a lost opportunity to, you know, uh, just also uh, uh, maintain some of the expertise that has been built up and use it for the continuation of the peace process. Um, and if they have a limited mandate and a defined role within the hierarchy of the conflict party, um, which is useful in order to avoid internal rivalry, for example, um, that actually can also limit uh, and reduce their potential to innovate and adapt, to take on new tasks uh, in, in the process, uh, or to develop maybe alternative approaches to conflict resolution, providing constructive feedback, for example, on negotiation efforts. Uh, if they have a mandate that they are just supposed to provide services, but not think out of the box or, or provide insights uh, from, from an expert's angle, um, then that again is a lost opportunity. Um, you have to give them that mandate. And that's, I think, one of the most important recommendations I'll come back to. Um, by focusing on the temporary structure also without strong multi-track linkages, um, uh, you might be reinforcing the exclusive logic of negotiations uh, between conflict party leaderships only uh, that are not connected to demands, needs and concerns of other tracks. So that's something also to look out for um, and, and not to just work with track one, obviously. I mean, this is what we're discussing here. Um, and with regards to secretariats of non-state actors, um, you might have to deal with a lot of issues with regards to sanctions, counterterrorism, legal frameworks, and prescription regimes, as, as we heard earlier already. So altogether, uh, supporting peace secretariats could be considered quite a bit of a risky investment, uh, since their role and contributions to a peace process are difficult to anticipate, really, and are difficult to plan in a donor's lock frame logic, as, as Ayak was also mentioning as well, um, it's difficult to, to manage this in, in a donor logic, but it's really important to acknowledge that peace secretariats are on the hand of the party leadership and, and so they cannot implement as planned often. And on the other hand, they really provide an interesting entry point uh, to enhancing and consolidating conflict party engagement in a peace process um, and your leverage points are there, the mandate that needs to be defined in a transformative way, which allows for expression of critical views and thinking out of the box really. Um, that's been something that peace secretariats in many places have been, uh, and the staff has been reflecting on saying, look, we were never told to be allowed to do this. If somebody had told us that we could provide these insights, for example, to the team, uh, we would have certainly, but uh, but it's not our place to step in and say, why don't you think about this option? So you might want to think about creating a mandate for them uh, if you are supporting peace secretariats um, and advising the parties in that way. Then also it's about resourcing. Uh, that's a leverage point, obviously, uh, but you have to be quite cautious of appearances here um, because they don't want to, that must not be seen as an externally funded agent, of course. Uh, and then thirdly, really the interlinkages with a larger infrastructure for peace, uh, which would encourage a grounding in peace building uh, communities and the other tracks. And therefore I suggest that mediators and other third party peace supporters should pay more attention um, to advising conflict parties on, on the creation and functioning of effective support structures 
uh, for example, by offering lessons learned and advice uh, to parties um, when they're getting ready uh, with regards to the mandate and functions and scope of peace secretaries, rather than just letting it happen as it's quite often the case that they just put some of their people in this. Uh, but by making this a bit more deliberate, uh, it could be quite a useful uh, and effective structure to support a peace process. So much for now, thank you. Thanks so much Ulrike and it's a really great reminder that we can sort of see these secretariats as more than just a sort of technical um, administrative um, site that they can be far more transformative um, if empowered um, to do so. Okay, John, hopefully we can hear you now. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Yes, great. <laughs> so some kind of a glitch. Maybe that's a divine intervention because I think there's maybe a little logic that, I, that uh, uh, we come to this topic uh, afterwards. But let me first of all begin by expressing my uh, gratitude and appreciation to uh, the organizers, um, uh, USIP and, and uh, Conciliation Resources, uh, for whom a number of uh, old associates, um, it's nice to see again. Uh, let me say that uh, in the case of Conciliation Resources, let me just congratulate you for all the great work you're doing that routinely makes Jonathan Cohen look good. Um, with regard to, uh, <laughs> I think Jonathan's watching, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let me also say that uh, I was happy to contribute to this as a co-author, uh, chapter nine of the um, Accord series. And my co-author, Sally Holt is here. She's been a co-author with me, or I've been a co-author with her in the past. And uh, it's good to have her here so she can correct any error I may uh, share. Uh, now, the topic of self-determination in the context of uh, this meeting, I would say is interesting a bit because it's the only substantive issue in dispute uh, if we think about a, a peace process or if we think about a conflict analysis. So otherwise we've heard about conflict analysis, we've heard about processes, process design, um, the perspective of particular interest groups or uh, support um, uh, peace secretariat. But of course, a conflict, a violent conflict, is over something. People, uh, uh, people on the whole don't kill each other uh, for the heck of it. There are a few pathological uh, people in the world, but on the whole, such conflicts arise out of things in dispute. And, uh, and self-determination uh, cases or situations have a preponderance. In fact, according to the Uppsala uh, conflict data set, uh, fully 50% of violent conflicts in the world that they've tracked the last uh, few decades are self-determination related. Um, an interesting thing about self-determination is that it's a misnomer. Uh, neither an individual nor a group uh, literally self-determines. Uh, it's always the function of some kind of relationship, even if it's uh, coercive, uh, some degree of recognition, but nobody literally determines oneself. Uh, and it's also not a zero-sum game. That's another uh, myth. Uh, Self-determination disputes are often thought of as uh, win-lose, either or, all or nothing. Uh, and that's partly uh, a misunderstanding of uh, both the normative side of self-determination, what it actually contains, but also its character. So a lot of self-determination disputes are by their character not only mutable, they're also fungible. They're elements of what you're trying to determine that could be shared, traded, uh, uh, and, and so forth, even dissociable. Um, there are, of course, kinds of self-determination, increasingly well-known, uh, the so-called internal, uh, staying within the existing state structure, uh, degrees of autonomy, decentralization, whether symmetrical, asymmetrical, and so forth. Uh, and this could be through normal processes, such as uh, democratization that grants more participation to local authorities and so forth. Uh, or it could be uh, something unique and specially designed. Uh, and then external self-determination, which is uh, the idea of uh, separation or uh, what is sometimes called independence. Again, another mytho mythical notion, nobody is actually independent in the world uh, as, as we now know. I'll just mention climate change <laughs> as one uh, factor. Um, so uh, the, the other prefiguratory remark I'll make is that in uh, life in general, but particularly in conflict situations uh, which arise out of sustained grievances, which is the origin of most self-determination disputes, um, it tends to be easier to identify what one is against than what one is really for. 
So self-determination claims and disputes tend to arise out of long frustration, uh, persistent grievances that go unaddressed, exclusionary exploitative systems where uh, the party that is exploited after time simply gives up on any kind of a, of a commitment to a future, uh, a living together arrangement and it throws up their hands and says, we want out. Uh, and that's a, a common feature. Uh, now, what they're out and how that works and what they're really seeking to actually control are wholly different uh, questions. Uh, 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 by the way, this is not speculative. Uh, the minorities at risk uh, data set and the self-determination movements data set both identify gaps in time between what uh, uh, Ted Gurr called articulation of grievance. He said between the statement that a group has had enough and wants out, there's about 10 years between that and the eruption of violence. Uh, this uh, self-determination movements has tracked that at, at more like six years. Okay, let me just recall a few elements about, uh, uh, about uh, 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 self-determination kind of disputes. And uh, let me say it's pretty obvious that uh, the more a state or a society has integrated inclusive participatory uh, processes where people's needs, interests, and aspirations variably uh, can be uh, mediated, uh, can be basically managed nonviolently, uh, the better the chances of a sustainable peace. So in other words, the absence of those kind of institutions and mechanisms correlates with violence uh, eruption. Uh, so what does that mean in short? It means that democratic societies on the whole actually are more sustainable in their peace. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and that should be troubling for us because if you read Freedom House's annual reports, we now have 15 years of consecutive uh, deteriorations and diminution of democracies. And the last year was one of the worst. Um, uh, so uh, let me identify five quick challenges of self-determination. One is that self-determination is not equivalent with separation. Uh, that's, uh, that's a reductionist, um, uh, let me say myopic interpretation. Uh, second is that self-determination um, is, uh, uh, is not, um, does not require uh, a zero sum breach of others' rights that I get my out and you lose. Uh, that, uh, for example, we can imagine all sorts of shared arrangements, conditional arrangements, uh, and so forth. Third of all, a lot of self determination disputes um, from uh, our perspective are actually labeling problems, uh, essentially faults in conflict analysis, but where the parties don't quite understand themselves uh, what, what the problem is. Um, and, and we see that, for example, a lot of claims come out of uh, persistent uh, violation of minority rights, uh, which or, or uh, systematic or systemic human rights violations that are group related. So often minority rights, indigenous rights and so forth. And uh, so we can imagine that uh, if these human rights or minority rights would be fully respected, uh, we, we're not even in the realm of discussing self-determination. Um, uh, these might include things like issues of recognition, uh, representation, uh, uh, you know, and, and so forth. Uh, fourth issue is um, uh, no group is homogenous. So this is another idea that we have kind of discrete groups that are claimants uh, and they're kind of, uh, 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 that, in fact, every group has its own variations of uh, degrees of, uh, uh, of interest and uh, internal dynamics. Uh, and so claims and positions vary over time. Uh, and, uh, and, and specifically the, the options of self-determination, whether internal or external, may also vary over time. So this is just a, uh, another thing we have to keep uh, abreast with because often parties will have positions which are fixed out of particular uh, historical or other situations and are no longer perhaps germane. For example, as the European Union expanded, uh, claims of independence became uh, irrelevant. We can talk about Northern Ireland, for example, where, where uh, at least when Ireland and the UK were both within the European Union, a number of issues simply disappeared because uh, they were uh, diluted within a broader European Union framework. And then the last challenge is the role of external parties, in particular other states, notably kin, so-called kin states or di diasporas, which often are uh, themselves exploitative or exacerbating in positions. They can actually cause harm rather than help. And they're often uh, pursuing, you know, uh, other interests and so forth. So these are challenges. Um, and and uh, without uh, taking much more time, I'll just point out three uh, key issues that, uh, that uh, I think need to be uh, addressed in, in uh, dealing with self-determination cases. The first is to prize astute analysis. 
uh, so basically this is advocating really quality conflict analysis. So many times it's poorly done. Uh, and there are a lot of actors that need help in that analysis. And I could tell you lots of experiences and cases. The second is uh, there is no cookie cutter uh, uh, solution. Uh, so you know what may work in one place almost invariably has distinctions in any other place. In this sense, every situation is unique to some degree. And what we have to pay attention to is tailoring or design elements uh, which prize creativity, what actually works in a specific context. And the third and final element is, uh, is the role of, um, of third parties to help. I was struck just by the last speaker because uh, one of the elements I would say in peace support and my own work, uh, both uh, in the United Nations, but also in the OSCE, is we actively assisted parties to better understand their interests, what I would call enlightened self-interest, and to actually propose options, not, not to press options, not to uh, impose, but to uh, set a kind of menu of different things that could be helpful. And I would call this a sort of uh, soft education uh, in which uh, you assist the parties to build specialized knowledge that they often lack. So in this case, it prizes know-how. Uh, and finally, all of this earlier is better. Uh, if we can engage early on when these grievances exist, the chances of preventing uh, violence are high. And as I began my remarks, one half of all international conflicts are self-determination related. Thank you for allowing me the time uh, to address the meeting. Thanks so much, John, for that incredibly um, succinct walkthrough of a, an incredibly complex topic. Really appreciate that. Uh, so we have a couple of questions that have come in and our four speakers have touched on many of the of the themes that are woven across the accord as well and John for example touches on um, the power and the potential of really lifting our game on conflict analysis and that it is so lacking um, considering where we're at in in the sector um, the power of lenses and filters, um, thinking at, from transformative rather than technocratic perspectives. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, Ayak to please respond to one of the first questions that has come in um, around working with young people and approaches to dealing with the past and also the politics of memory for the purposes of reconciliation, conflict transformation. Thoughts and perspectives on that, Ayak. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, I'll, I'll highlight a couple of initiatives that are currently ongoing. The first is Anataban, which I am a part of. Um, and the main intention of, of Anataban is to address the ethnic division. The po politics has really driven uh, you know, has really polarized people ethnically, uh, especially young people. And so what we're doing is the initiative is Arts for Peace. We're using art as a tool for uniting people, uh, getting people to be in a feel-good space where they could do all sorts of arts, painting uh, for trauma healing, uh, mural and poetry and whatnot. And that has created a community. Uh, that has also gone to the to the residential areas. Uh, now we have units beyond beyond the refugee camps, beyond the cities like Nairobi and Uganda and Kampala and Addis and Juba, beyond the conflict areas like Ye and Wow and other places in South Sudan. We have reached residential areas. Now there is a unit that is called Anataban Johila, which means Anataban at the residential areas, where Anatabers are. Uh, forming nucleus of youth uh, at their residential areas and addressing issues that are happening in their neighborhoods, uh, including uh, issues of gangs and whatnot. And those issues are addressed through art therapy. Um, additionally, there's uh, initiatives like TTT, which is taking tea together. It's a customary Sudanese, uh, South Sudanese uh, thing sit under a tree and drink tea and that space has is also being used to uh, to, to 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 transform the pain that has happened to just uh, create a space where people are able to communicate openly uh, over tea um, we're also using the Nepalese model of uh, the spider 
um, networking. I don't know if you're familiar with with, with that, uh, but we're also using that model that is uh, that that's a Nepalese model. Um, it's called spider networking, and that is identifying uh, youth leaders in in key areas where there are conflicts, and then bringing um, and then having a group of youth from different communities visit that youth where they are. Just the visuals of seeing people from different communities, different religions, um, different ethnicities, just um, uh, working together, um, just that visual actually changes people's perceptions, um, you know, about, oh, I didn't know a new person was friendly, or I didn't know a Dinka person, you know, could do this and could do that and knows how to play soccer and can laugh and smile. So it's small things like that done at very, very uh, local level, uh, including things like uh, soccer for peace and basketball for peace and theater for peace. Uh, but um, just opening a space where people can actually address issues um, through sports or art. Um, yeah. So yes, we are we are we are doing a lot of uh, conflict transformation as well. Yeah, and it's subtle and intergenerational, and it takes a long time to ferment. And it goes back to a point that has been made earlier around that this is not always so conducive to log frames and um, sort of distinct. Uh, project cycles. Okay, so Irina, you have the, the task of um, this very knotty question around why is it so hard to make alliances between authorities and youth organizations? So first of all, why is it so hard, these hierarchies, but also is there um, an example that you can give us of where this has been transcended quite powerfully. Thank you very much for the question. And I would just add to the point that Ayak made a moment ago uh, when we talk about uh, processes and peace processes, it's the key reason that they need to be youth friendly as young people are literally the generation that will bridge to peace. So I just wanna emphasize underscore also what Ayak was saying. So this tough question, thank you. Um, a big issue here on the, on the why is the issue of trust. And this goes both ways. Uh, young people often do not want to be part of political or state processes that they see as corrupt, broken, uh, and not serving them nor representing them. And we see that in huge um, uh, age gaps, let's say, and, and ger gerontocratic societies. Um, that simply do not represent young people and critically do not protect them. And we see that in many countries where uh, the authorities that are meant to represent and protect do quite the opposite uh, through the securitization or pacification of, of youth issues. So trust is a big issue. Um, and the, the youth peace and security agenda, as I mentioned, seeks to address particularly that, that relationship, that intergenerational relationship that is so fundal, fundamental. Sorry, it's getting late here. My tongue is slipping. Um, and, and, and I'm sure Ayat can add some points also around, around the why. Uh, and, and so this, this, the, the youth peace and security agenda, yes, is, is particularly important in this regard. And some good examples that, that might be highlighted are uh, youth peace and security coalitions that are being formed or joint initiatives, um, intergenerational dialogue that kind of comes through um, and really um, taking on what we'd say partnerships for principles for meaningful youth participation. Uh, and that means really listening and partnering with young people because young people know when they're uh, being, as all of us would, being treated as tokenistic or being manipulated and served for a purpose. So if we um, come in with an approach that is meaningful um, and sees young people as really critical partners in this, I mean, that's, that's gonna be one of the first steps in ameliorating some of these relationships. I'm not sure, Ayak, if you have a couple more points, if we have time. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll just add, uh, add uh, 
uh, I'll just add that for the South Sudan situation particularly, I feel like um, why why there's always friction between the authorities and the youth is there is a fear. Uh, most of the people in power right now are some of the leaders of the former uh, liberation movement for South Sudan. And they started this at the same age that we are right now. I think um, they they have um, they have taken the role of the former authority, and the youth have taken the role of the of the new nonviolent but still people's movement. I would say um, so. There is also that. Um, there is also that. Uh, it, there is a lot of fear. I would say. Okay, we, I think we might have lost I, I, temporarily. Um, we might just scoot over to this question that's for Ulrike around the tasks that you've described are sometimes taken by international actors, indeed they are. Um, and do you see the risk that very well resourced international actors doing this actually hinders national mechanisms, national ownership, or I might just add in there subnational? Or is this international role positive as these outside parties can bring um, various forms of expertise? Um, and is what are the constructive roles that international actors can play in establishing peace secretariats? Thanks. Mm. Yeah, it's a, that's a good one. I mean, really, I think it's about striking the balance. It's, it's both, right? It's neither yes or no for, for both. Um, I think um, what, what from my perspective would matter in a, in a, in a conflict transformation perspective, this, it's really about building up capacities, right, of, of the parties, of the stakeholders on the ground to, uh, to, uh, to position themselves, to prepare their own role in, in a process, to to actually shape the process themselves. And of course, they need often outside help, right? Be it from mediators, facilitators that, that bring them together, but also from all kinds of other third party actors that we, John Packer was just mentioning earlier, advising parties, right? On, on legal questions, constitutional reform ideas. I mean, there's so much um, expertise that, that is required to inform a party's position. They can't possibly have this in their own ranks, and especially if they come from, from years or decades of fighting uh, with lack of access to formal education often or academic education whatsoever. Um, it's, it's very important to build up those capacities and often that requires really um, expertise from outside. It often requires funding, actually. Um, I mean, we, we have all kinds of conflict parties that we look at. Of course, some of them are quite resourced um, and, and can fund this themselves. Uh, there are governments that can, there are non-state actors that can, there are others that cannot. Uh, and then sometimes it's really about helping them actually set up logistics of setting up an office uh, with them uh, to support them uh, to, to be ready and, and provide that access point. And mind you, this is not just about this binary government or, or the fighting parties, right? A peace secretariat, for example, speaking about youth movements and bringing youth representatives as their own constituency to the table would also mean they should have the same access to resources and, and support staff or that backbone uh, as the other parties. And in fact, in Sri Lanka, where, where I used to work, um, there were the negotiating parties, the government and the LTTE, but then the Muslim parties uh, that wanted to be part of the negotiations also had their own peace secretariat. Uh, they never actually made it to the table, uh, but they had their own peace secretariat. And, and that also contributed in a way to leveling the playing field to a certain extent, right? You, you are being resourced, you are having staff, you're having a dedicated address, um, you have uh, people that work on bringing expertise in. And I think it's really about these three things. It's about preparedness, it's about leveling playing field and bringing in expertise. And, and that third art party actors can do a lot to do that. 
uh, I think it's very much about comparative learning and, and access to outside information, uh, experiences from other contexts um, that you often need somebody as a go-between to, to you know, build that contact. These days you have a lot of information, of course, on social media and, and people who are, who are used to research this themselves uh, they they might you know find out the the Nepalese uh, uh, spider uh, networking model. Uh, they might find it themselves, but maybe it's also useful to sit down with people and work with them on options how to how to use experience from from other contexts. Um, so it's about that uh, really, and also I think another very important role of outside actors can be to be a sounding board, right? To be, if, if you have a trusted relationship with parties, to sit down with them. It's not just about running that seminar on constitutional reforms. It's being a sounding board to discuss ideas, right? Of, of developing ideas and proposals and, and help them shape them. Um, and that uh, even if you have a secretariat, often uh, it's still useful to have, uh, to have the outside uh, expertise. But um, I think what is really important to me, um, and, and I'm coming at this also a bit from a development perspective, it's about building up those internal resources. Because um, again, I mean, in Sri Lanka, uh, they realized at some stage that there was never anybody who had taken notes before when they set up the peace secretariats in 2002. Uh, they suddenly, the government realized they couldn't find any notes from any of the previous uh, efforts before of the talks because nobody had bothered to archive them in the country in in the government and and put them all together and even this this sounds a bit banal but that's really it really matters right that you build up expertise in the country uh, with these little things and therefore you need to have these structures you can't let this be run by outside actors only that then take away uh, their their expertise with them when they move on to another context where they work next. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ulrike. And I and I think that um, just reflecting on my experience of having basically worked in a um, armed group secretariat is that what I saw quite a lot, perhaps um, too much. Because uh, you will get a bit of this in the marketplace, but I think that I saw too much that there was the provision of comparative insights or um, information from international actors to uh, members of this secretariat, but it was rarely contextualized. And so it was almost useless. You may as well have not given the information. Yet, there was um, an ability to sort of say that uh, technical support had been provided, but really sort of on the inside of the secretariat, it just was just another meeting. It didn't really go anywhere. And so in the accord, we kind of, we do talk about this a lot, that it's, it's just not good enough to provide comparative advice and insights. It, must be contextualized. The onus is on international peace support actors to go the extra mile and to do that. And that does require um, different networks, different skills, and frankly, quite different perspectives. Okay, so John, a question in here for you about in cases where a group actually does enjoy some quite strong elements of internal self-determination in practice. Uh, for example, minority language education, what can be done to address the continued demand for external self-determination and or separatism driven by this historical grievance, this sense of grievance, intergenerational grievance that you referred to, how to open the dialogue? Thanks for the question. Uh, so first of all, uh, let me say that I 100% agree with uh, what you just remarked, Kate, and everything Ulrika said. Um, and, and it goes to, I think, the point of complexity. Uh, I, I try and teach my own students in this field that context is king. You, you really have to contextualize virtually everything. Uh, and, and that all depends also on, on uh, real quality conflict analysis. And then, of course, the ways in which you share uh, information, how that's conveyed and, and, and so forth. Uh, but in this regard, um, let's not forget that there is a right to self-determination. 
so normatively, uh, international law, and it's actually pretty foundational uh, uh, in the post uh, Second World War international rules based order. Uh, and, uh, and there are specific contexts in which that right uh, can be perfected. For example, um, external occupation, a colonial regime, uh, a racist regime. Uh, but there are increasingly cases, as we're seeing, I think a lot of cases in the last couple of generations, which are either variations of that or not quite that, but uh, are essentially products of, of this persistent frustration. What they give rise to is um, not just uh, the absence of trust and confidence for something short of separation. Uh, people basically don't believe it. They're not re ready to invest in it. Uh, but also the symbolic elements. So, you know, another way of saying self-determination is people want to have control of their destiny. They want to be, uh, you know, a phrase in my own country in Canada was, you know, to be masters in my own home. That was a, a phrase of the uh, uh, Quebec uh, independence movement. Uh, and, uh, and one can understand that, especially if one has been subjected to long periods of uh, repression, if not oppression. Uh, so uh, now, at the same time, there are many, many cases where uh, groups simply don't understand the risks associated with this kind of imagined idea or the cost of the symbolic uh, uh, su success of separation. Um, uh, because uh, then when, when that's better understood, and this is what I mean by uh, soft education, the trade-offs on this, there are, are real costs associated with it uh, that are probably not uh, interested. For example, many groups, uh, when they claim for separation or independence, they're not actually thinking about being responsible for monetary policy. They're not talking about printing their own money, you know, but that's what comes with being independent. It's an immediate monetary question, <laughs> Who, who's in control? Uh, that's not on their mind at all. They're talking about their uh, coherence of their ethno-cultural group, the maintenance of their identity and so forth. So I, I think that, that, that going back to this point of complexity, uh, that there is, it, I agree with you, Kate, it's kind of, um, uh, it, it's a responsibility of the international community uh, because we have an interest, the international community has an interest in sustainable peace and development to actually uh, express what are the costs, what are the alternatives and so forth. And, and then to also act early to create some kind of believable scenarios for groups to be actually able to, um, uh, let me say, uh, be satisfied with less, satisfied for less, I don't, that sounds the wrong thing. I've just said the wrong thing because it's not like they're not gonna be fulfilled. It's that what is the different pathway that might vindicate their actual grievance or concern? And I think by expressing that carefully, uh, we, we can actually diminish the violence potential. Thanks so much, John. And um, you know, as, you were, as you were talking, I was just thinking about the the um, enormous scope of decentralization and the lived everyday experiences, positive experiences that that can bring people with self-determination shaped grievances. And I definitely see that as a bit of a weak spot in the peace support community that um, we are a little bit fuzzy about kind of what that means. Um, from a rights perspective, particularly. Okay, um, if, are there any more questions or comments that people would like to make, uh, reflections? If not, um, I am going to just give a little space to Akiko Horiba from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation to make any comments or uh, inputs if you would like. Thank you very much, Kate. I learned a lot and then uh, I actually really want to apply to the Southern Thailand case. <laughs> so the, for example, peace, secret peace secretariat, I think it is really, I mean, uh, great to apply to the, the I mean, the uh, Southern Thailand armed group, for example, and then talking about self-determination, it is really true that the, what uh, armed group in Th Thailand is a, uh, you know, the misunderstood, <laughs> the, 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 the meaning of the self-determination and then just that they have uh, one option 
of the independent, but they actually don't understand what they have to prepare so that external uh, actors can, you know, uh, accompany them and then let them understand more completely what uh, we can do for peace, you know. So thank you so much for your sharing. And then I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks, Akiko. And um, it was with the generosity of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and um, Akiko's commitment to flexible funding, um, as well as the Swiss government that the accord was able to be produced. And uh, we thank both of, of, our, of the donors for that, of walking the talk. Um, as we sort of close, I'm just going to touch on, again, some of the kind of essential um, currents, I think might be the best way to refer to them in the accord. And just kind of coming back to this topic around preparedness. Uh, John, did you want to come in here before I close if, off? If you don't mind, I, I, it's just that Akiko yep, said something that connected with a couple other things I thought I'd just quickly comment on. Uh, this, um, it, it sounds maybe aud audacious to say they don't understand, but I, I think we mean this in a literal sense because uh, that uh, a lot of uh, protagonists, uh, uh, conflict parties are you know, fighting over a long period of time. Uh, or uh, for example, I can tell you in places like Yemen and many other places, uh, long persistent periods of um, uh, poverty, persecution and so forth, you have 70% illiteracy rates. So the idea that, that their representatives have some kind of deep knowledge about all the alternatives is just a false premise. Uh, and, and I mean, that partly a little bit relates to youth. You know, I, I was actively involved in bringing youth in, for example, to the Yemen process. But, you know, there wasn't a uh, professor of constitutional law in the youth group, <laughs> for example. Uh, so there, there is a need for the provision uh, of knowledge that can ad address these issues, as uh, Akiko was saying. Uh, there are many groups that I have encountered that simply are unaware, uh, and I often ask them, if you, if you got self-determination, their claim, what would you do with it? And they're not even sure what the answer to that question is because they're so uh, kind of allied with, with the slogan, we want out, you know, we want to separate. They haven't actually thought it through. So I just wanted to underline Akiko's observation. Southern Thailand is another case where I think this is definitely true. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yes, um, and that I think speaks to the dynamics across generations as well and um, yeah, how we carry those expectations forward. So we have uh, talked quite a bit about um, sort of almost uh, say one half of, of what you can find in the Accord. And um, in terms of thinking about preparedness, there might be sort of two uh, overarching ways of thinking about it. So the first one is really about uh, the transition to dialogue. Sophie talked about that a lot. Jonathan did as well, as well as others. Um, thinking about the ways that we support conflict parties, belligerents, to make those steps to dialogue. And those are very cyclical. There's a lot of failure inherent in, in building those pathways. Nonviolent movements is a very strong focus throughout the accord and Jonathan provides a sort of the evidence base for uh, how those movements are sort of shaping and forming and, and evolving over time. Across the accord, there are a lot of really powerful examples of how nonviolent movements are actually bringing parties to the table, but also shaping what is discussed at the table and therefore in the agreements. And I think we can see very clearly um, every day now in Myanmar that the next phase of uh, the Myanmar political transition is going to involve great investment in nonviolent movements that are informal, opaque, and um, do not come in the sort of NGO-shaped box. So for international actors, that means we need to change the way that we work. Um, inclusion, a very, very, very big theme across the accord in many different ways. 
uh, youth, gender, um, other hierarchies of exclusion and oppression, and really trying to kind of crack the nut on what it means to put those things into practice. So a strong focus on the how, I think you can hopefully find. The next theme would be around navigating complexity. And, and John Packer has referred to this as well as other speakers that we really need to um, rethink the way that we understand um, these processes as, as profoundly complicated. And um, a lot of, the, of our sort of stock standard approaches are in some ways um, inadequate. So the first one, we've touched upon it, is really improving the way that we conduct analysis. And that is both um, thinking about inclusive and joint analysis, um, but conflict analysis that focuses also on peace drivers and peace connectors. Conflict analysis is often so disconnected from peace influences and levers of peace. The other um, aspect of navigating complexity, and we see this in many places around the world, is that um, there is um, growing uh, allergies towards international involvement, but also we see new generations coming to the fore as insider mediators, and we see people of influence in many different layers of a conflict-affected country. And so we need to, I think, be looking at the subnational level in quite a different way and applying a different filter for seeing who or what is a peace mediator and a peace facilitator and rethinking the idea of international sort of interventions around mediation being the kind of stock standard. And finally, we have touched upon it in different ways today, but the Accord places a very strong emphasis on funding dynamics in peace processes. And in fact, recently, there was a dedicated seminar on this topic, which you can find the recording for on the Conciliation Resources website. Um, I'll try and chuck it into the, the chat now. All the dynamics around um, projectization of peace funding, um, the lack of flexibility, the timeframes, the results-based era are all kind of swirling together to make the kinds of um, funding basis for this work quite difficult. And there is several different discussions going on around that of how we can uh, rethink the type of funding that's required for these early, informal, opaque, very messy phases, which often go on for, for years and years, um, sometimes for decades. And if you would like to sort of tap into any of these different streams, please uh, do be in contact with us and um, give us your feedback and your thoughts, um, share your ideas on the articles. We really welcome that. Okay, over to Zand or Jonathan. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, it's really just for me to, to sort of say thanks to everybody. I mean, it's been a fascinating conversation. I was really interested yeah, in the whole, um, sort of transition movement, uh, moment, the sort of early transition movement and some of those conversations that we've been having. And um, we've got an article in the publication um, where we're talking to some armed groups. Um, and the transition into dialogue was was difficult, you know, for some of the people we were talking to, particularly uh, the whole idea of compromise, you know, and a lot of um, armed groups entering, or some of the ones we were talking to, that moment of entering into transition, it wasn't a moment to start compromising. It was a moment to get their sort of maximalist demands through dialogue, you know. And so the change to actually to thinking about compromise was was quite a long process for them, sort of um, ideologically, I guess. Um, and <clears throat> so that was, uh, you know, that was that was quite an interesting moment. But um, finally, just to say a big thanks to everybody for this um, for this event. It's been absolutely fascinating. It's great. It's always a great moment to get. Um, contributors to an accord publication together sort of in as in person as we can get at the moment um 
it's been it's lived up to its expectations in my opinion um and more uh so a big thank you to our donors, um, the, who Kate mentioned again at the end there. A big thank you to USIP for all the fantastic insights you've given us on um, uh, nonviolent movements and for helping us and working with us on this event um, this evening. Um, a big thanks to my colleagues, um, uh, Sally Holt and Felix Colchester for um, organizing the event so excellently, along with colleagues at USIP. Um, thanks to Kate for editing the publication and engaging with us on this project. Thanks to you all for, for, for coming and hope to see you again soon. <laughs>